Uh, my name is Mike Bolong. I'm, uh, I'm the first Scripps Fellow in the Department of Chemistry, and we're starting uh, a, a chemical biology lab from scratch. And like many of the presenters talking here today, um, we're interested in the earliest phase of small molecule drug discovery. So we make um, good use of the screening center at Caliber to ask the question in an unbiased way, does some small molecule exist, some piece of chemical matter for solving the biological problem? that we're asking. Um, so you may have heard about a lot of the stem cell based uh, uh, of biology and drug discovery that was happening with Kristen and Luke. Um, that was actually happening a lot during my PhD and I wondered whether we could take that just one step further and actually do small molecule drug discovery uh, for regenerative medicine. Can we actually find small molecules which we manipulate um, both the stem cells in our bodies as well as the cell growth pathways which control regeneration? Basically asking the question, can we regrow organs piece by piece, cell by cell, to intervene in various diseases of aging? Now that sounds a bit like science fiction and a bit like a tall order, but I'm hoping that I can convince you through two stories today, two very early stage stories, that these, this is actually uh, perhaps a real possibility in, in the coming next few years. So we started our foray into um, uh, regenerative medicine by asking the question, can we manipulate organ size? Um, so if you've ever wondered why your organs stay the same size as they do, it's because there's a pathway that controls that, interestingly enough. Um, so the, pa the major pathway in, in animals is actually called the hippo yat pathway. It's conserved from flies to mammals. And it's, it's been shown that if you, if you knock out various members of this pathway, you get organ overgrowth. Now, the, the pathway is quite simple, really. Of, so it consists of both an activator, you can consider YAP as a transcriptional gas pedal telling cells and organs to grow until it reaches a certain density at which um, the HIPPO pathway takes over, serving as a cell uh, density sensor, which tells YAP to then turn off. What fascinated us so much about this pathway was that YAP is absolutely essential for all of the mammalian regenerative processes that occur. YAP is also essential for all of the stem cells in your body to regrow and repopulate your organs. So we came up with a very simple-minded idea that we might be able to identify small molecules which turn on YAP when it had been turned off. And this might allow us to regrow organs, at least to the certain stage that they had been, been before they had been damaged, and then take the drug away um, and, and hopefully cure whatever disease of aging that we are trying to address. Um, the caveat here being that you don't want to activate YAP in any disease state, right? The disease has to be incredibly uh, uh, detrimental to the, to, the, to the individual, and it should the, the medical risk should very much outweigh the potential risk for proliferative disease. We think an appropriately devastating disease is, of course, heart failure, which affects many millions of Americans and is essentially incurable with the current standards of care. Um, so, uh, um, basically, what happens in heart failure is that. Cardiomyocytes die, the muscle cells of your heart die in response to a heart attack and they, and they don't grow back. Among the very few pathways that promote cardiomyocyte growth are the YAP pathway, among very few others. But very interestingly, you can, our, our collaborator, um, James Martin, has shown that three weeks after a heart attack, if you activate YAP, you can actually cause the heart to regrow. So that led us to the idea that if we could activate YAP after someone had had a heart attack, that we might be able to regrow the muscle cells of the heart actually cons and basically consisting of a de facto cure for the disease if we found a drug that could do this. So believe it or not, we actually think that we did this. So we ran a million compound screen at Caliber and found a small molecule which very efficaciously activates YAP. It's still not exactly a drug candidate yet, but it is the, to date the most efficacious activator of YAP that's been found. What's really interesting is that, unfortunately, the, the molecule does not have great pharmacokinetics, but we can rub it on mouse skin and show that we do get a five-fold increase in the thickening of the skin because YAP actually controls the regenerative properties of the skin as well as the heart. So using our, our sort of patented target identification technology, we actually found something very fascinating, which is that YAP um, is actually activated in this case by, t by the small molecule targeting a completely novel member of the pathway called an exon 2 An exon 2 has not been found through any chemical screens or genetic screens, but only through, through chemical proteomics. So what we found is that an exon 2 actually binds YAP directly. It localizes it to the plasma membrane, 
where it, where it serves to, to receive negative phosphorylation of that cell density. In response to compound treatment, however, Nexin 2 relocalizes and does not go to the plasma membrane, which alleviates YAP phosphorylation repressors, and YAP is then free to activate a transcriptional program. So if this molecule is meant to be a cardiac drug, it should proliferate the muscle cells of the heart very well. And gratifyingly, it does do this. We can see that in both short-term and long-term assays that PY60, which is a molecule we found, promotes like a, at least a tenfold outgrowth in cardiomyocytes and culture. And what's so fascinating to me about this particular cell type is their absolute fragility. If you plate them in culture and then replate them, all of the untreated cells die. But if you treat with our compound called PY60, you can see that the cells survive in culture for weeks at a time. And if you have keen eyes, you can see that these cells are still beating. So we think in the future, this might actually be a way to reverse heart failure and might actually constitute a cure, but we're still early days in this project. We're still trying to do a medicinal chemistry campaign to see if we can optimize the pharmacokinetic properties of, and potency of this molecule to actually test this in animal models of heart failure. But hopefully I've convinced you that this, the future is bright for this project, um, um, but we're still, we're still um, trying to optimize the properties there. Um, so we also have a really big interest in trying to manipulate the, the stem cells of, of the lung, but it's, it's not been clear exactly which cell population to target um, in the lung for some time. Um, so the lung is actually mostly empty space, but in the rest of the tissue, there are approximately 20 other cell types, each of which contribute to the unique physiology of, of the lung. It was only until recently that our collaborator, Paul Noble, found out that the primary uh, progenitor cell in the lung is actually a, a cell called an AEC2 cell or al alveolar type 2 cell. So the primary unit of gas exchange in the lung is actually the alveolus. And for our purposes today, you could consider um, there are two really important epithelial cells, one of which is called an AEC1 cell, which is big and flat. And in this case, in this, in this picture, it's, it's purple and provides all of the surface area for gas exchange. There's another type of cell called an AEC2 cell, which I mentioned. This cell secretes surfactant, which is essentially the chemical equivalent of soap, so the lung doesn't collapse. But what was really interesting to us is that the AEC2 cell also gives rise to AEC1 cells. And that happens very slowly. So AEC2s give rise to AEC1s. And this is actually looking at clonal growth over the course of 10 weeks. You can see that each AEC2 gives rise to maybe 5 to 10 cells, meaning that its half-life or its, its rate of division is maybe one every two weeks, meaning that these cells give rise to easy ones very slowly. This gave us the sort of mechanistic rationale for wanting to, to, to maybe accelerate the rate at which AEC2s give rise to AEC ones. Can we find small molecules which actually proliferate these cells? And that might help us reestablish barrier function in the lung, which is lost in many diseases of, of aging in the lung. The most um, relevant of which is actually idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So historically, fibrosis has been thought of as, as really a disease of, of scar tissue deposition. Um, but at, the, at its heart, what has happened in the field recently is people have realized that it is really an exhaustion of AEC2 proliferation, which gives rise to this phenomenon. So the inability to maintain epithelial barrier function results in two phenotypes, the first of which is that uh, upper airway cells of, uh, uh, that are epithelial in nature actually colonize the lower airway and, and, and secrete mucus and, and, and result in inappropriate proliferation called honeycombing cysts. But this also results in inappropriate crosstalk between AEC2 cells and the fibroblasts of the lung, which results in scar tissue deposition, which is characteristic of the disease. So we came up with the simple idea that we might be able to find small molecules which proliferate AEC2s, and that might really establish um, uh, the, the appropriate um, epithelial turnover so that we might actually target the, um, the cause of the disease state in, in, in fibrosis. And we also think that this might be beneficial for a number of other lung diseases, but it, it makes the most sense, I think, to us to intervene in, in fibrosis first. We think in particular that there might be um, additional applicability in ARDS, or acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, so to look for molecules which might promote AEC2 proliferation, we found, uh, uh, we set up a very, very simple screen of caliber where we took he primary human AEC2s 
and put them into medium at which they did not die, but then they didn't proliferate either. And we basically asked the simple question, what pushes them back into the cell cycle? And what we found was really phenomenal. We found that multiple classes of, of DPP4 inhibitors, which are, are called glyptins, they're a type 2 diabetes drug, actually promote the expansion of these cells very robustly, either in monolayer culture or in 3D culture, which means that they're growing as a mixed composite of different types of cells. And in particular, what's interesting to me is that it only causes the growth of AEC2s and doesn't affect their differentiation potential. So they can still turn into AEC1 cells, but they don't, they, there's really nothing else that happens to the, the other populations that are growing with them, including fibroblasts. So it doesn't cause fibrosis itself. It's a very specific uh, response. So how does this happen? Actually, DPP4, so the glyptins basically inhibit an extracellular protease called DPP4. D in the context of diabetes, DPP4 degrades in cretin hormones like GLP-1 and GIP, which regulate the, the, re the levels of insulin in the, cell, in, in the bloodstream. When DPP4 is inhibited, the levels of incretin hormones go up, which results in blood glucose lowering. But what's not so well known in the literature is that DPP4 also degrades many dozens of other signaling molecules. And in the case of AEC2 cells, it regulates the levels of autocrinely produced IL-6 and IGF-1, which are essential for the growth of these cells, this cell population. We know this to be true because we can neutralize these effects by inhibiting IL-6 or, or, or IGF-1 with neutralizing antibodies or siRNAs to, that, to, those, to those responses, and we show that we can inhibit that proliferative response. So we, this is still, again, another early stage project, but we're looking now to evaluate whether or not this molecule, in addition to standard of care, might be a new way to treat IPF. So with that, I hope I've, I've convinced you a little bit that we are doing an okay job at, at sort of trying to untap some of the regenerative potential that, that exists in mammalian uh, systems and that there's potentially a, a, a very sp a special role for chemical genetics in, in this space. Um, I'd like to briefly thank the people that worked on it, including Edita, who helped me with the YAP project, and, and Stephen, who did all the AEC2 work. So thank you very much for your attention.